object-oriented ontology, which is the kind of philosophy I do. Uh, probably the easiest way to describe it is to contrast it with mainstream modern philosophy. Modern philosophy has many different complex contours, but they can be boiled down all to the following basic assumption. There are two kinds of things in the cosmos, human thought and everything else. Over here you have human thoughts, over here you have animals, plants, rocks, asteroids, stars. And that might sound crazy, but of course it's based on the idea that human thought is the one really evident thing that we are able to make contact with directly. Because even if everything I experience were just an illusion, um, I would have to be thinking in order to be deluded or deceived. So it's based on an idea of that the human thought is the only thing that's certain and everything else is mediated or less certain. However, object-oriented ontology does something different. It does what we call a flat ontology, where we say that everything's on the same footing at the beginning. Uh, human thought is one kind of thing. Uh, microplastic fibers are another. A bear is another. A tree is another. A comet is another. A square circle is another. You have to start by giving all objects equal status before you make any a priori distinction between them at the beginning. That's one thing object-oriented ontology is known for. The other one, even more relevant today, is the notion of aesthetics as first philosophy. And I'm going to try to explain today what I mean by that. Why is aesthetics the basis of philosophy? I mentioned yesterday George Santayana, the American philosopher of the early 20th century, pointed out that beauty is very important in all of our lives, even though it is fairly minor in the discipline of philosophy. Aesthetics is kind of a charming side discipline, usually, in philosophy. You, you engage in aesthetics to show that you're a well-rounded, cultured person, whereas the heavy hitters do logic or metaphysics or theory of knowledge. Aesthetics has always been pushed to the side. I say it deserves to stand right in the middle. All right. Why do I think that? Why do I think that the beautiful is so important for philosophy? Let's start by saying that the opposite of the beautiful is not the ugly. Beautiful and ugly are not opposites. In a way, they're like twins, one good and one evil, perhaps, that you see in some fairy tales. The, the, the ugly is simply an unpleasant version of the beautiful. They both compel us in the same way. It's hard to escape either of them. We feel ourselves riveted by both the beautiful and the ugly. The real opposite of the beautiful, I would say, is the literal. The simply plain old literal, which is neither beautiful nor ugly. How do I define literal? My definition of the literal is something that treats an object as interchangeable with its qualities. An object simply is equivalent to its, to its qualities. So to make a literal statement about anything is simply to say what qualities it has and to be accurate about that. So to say this, this thing here weighs 9.5 pounds or um, one football team is better than another team. Assuming these are accurate statements, they're also literal statements. They're simply ascribing tangible qualities to certain things. I mentioned yesterday that the high point of this view of literalism in the history of philosophy is probably the British empiricists uh, running from uh, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume being the three main ones, late 1600s, early 1700s. And I also mentioned Hume's idea that there isn't really an apple in your hand. You can't be sure there's something underneath all the qualities called an apple. What's in your hand is red, round, juicy, cold, sweet, tart, shiny. And these qualities go together so often that you start sort of adopting this nickname apple for all those qualities. But all you're really encountering, according to Hume, are the qualities. That's a good example of literalism. Um, whatever else might be said about it that's good. Hume is a very important philosopher and a wonderful writer, uh, but he's a literalist. He assumes that there's nothing more to the object than its qualities. Hume lived from 1711 to 1776, but there's a, a, a very prolific younger German philosopher right now, Marcus Gabriel at the University of Bonn, born in 1980, who says something very similar in his book, Fields of Sense. He says an object is equivalent to all the truths that hold about it. An object is simply the sum of all the true facts that can be ascribed to it. It's another form of literalism, because there, the object is nothing more than a bundle of true statements, rather than a bundle of qualities. And as I said yesterday also, the school of philosophy that opposes this literalism the most fervently is phenomenology. Phenomenology started in 1900, 1901, uh, with Edmund Husserl's book, Logical Investigations. And what Husserl tells us in that book is that the object comes first. The object comes before the qualities. It's the opposite of what Hume says. We don't start with the qualities and then posit this mysterious object hiding behind them that doesn't really exist. Instead, we make direct contact with the object. And uh, to use the example I used yesterday, take the microphone and rotate it in my hand. I'm telling myself, okay, this is the same microphone. I'm seeing it from different angles. I'm not seeing all of its sides at once. I'm seeing different profiles of the microphone. Uh, 
but the microphone comes first. The profiles come second. They're all profiles of the microphone. I don't just see profiles and then somehow stitch them together afterwards. I see the microphone directly. The qualities come after. And I mentioned Merleau-Ponty's powerful example that the black of an ink pen and the black of an executioner's hood, he says, are different colors even if they are the exact same wavelength of lights. So even if the qualities seem measurably identical, they are different because the qualities are inflected by the objects to which they belong. The black of the executioner's hood is an ominous black uh, foreboding death and, and damnation, and in the case of the black ink pen, it's something much more benevolent or at least neutral. So the, the uh, object comes first for phenomenology. And every object always appears with certain qualities, but those qualities tend to be accidental and inessential. And what we do in phenomenology is we strip away those inessential qualities to try to get at the essence of the thing, the qualities that it really needs to be, really needs to have in order to be what it is. And so there's, the phenomenology is really about a tension between an object and its qualities. The object has any number of qualities. Some of them are essential, some of them are inessential. And it's the job of the phenomenologist to analyze those things very precisely and figure out which are which. And he, Rumor has it he spent a whole semester analyzing a mailbox with his students to try to figure out exactly what the essential features of the mailbox are. And interestingly, Husserl thought that the essential features are the one you can ones you can determine with your minds. The inessential features are the ones that appear to the senses, which sounds a bit like Plato, and, and Husserl's background was mathematical at first rather than philosophical. So that fits very well with what we would expect of him. Anyway, the important thing is that there's a tension between objects and qualities for Husserl that I would say he was the, the first to discover in the history of philosophy. There were a few approaches to that before him, but he's the one who really nailed it down. What Husserl doesn't give us is the idea of anything deep and hidden, something we cannot get at. For Husserl, he, he is very optimistic that everything in the world is knowable. He's a rationalist. He thinks there's nothing out there that's withdrawing from us. There's nothing like Kant's mysterious thing in itself that we can never grasp because we're trapped in a human mind. For Husserl, we can know everything that there is out there if we perform the proper procedures. In order to get the, the missing depth realm in phenomenology, uh, we have to go to Husserl's renegade student, Heidegger, who originally was Husserl's great hope. He's going to be the next great phenomenologist, continue on my footsteps. Uh, but Heidegger took things in a very different direction. Perhaps his most important uh, discovery, contrasting with Husserl, was the idea that things are not primarily present in the mind. Right? For Husserl, we can actually describe the phenomena by bringing them before our minds, rationally analyzing them. For Heidegger, that doesn't come first, that comes second. What comes first is all the things we're taking for granted. So for example, I'm walking on this stage and I wasn't thinking about it until a second ago when it popped into my mind. But I needed it. If I didn't have it, I'd fall to the floor and probably injure my legs. Um, you're not thinking about the oxygen in this room, or at least you weren't until I mentioned it, unless you have some kind of asthma issue or, or having difficulty breathing. These things tend to recede into the background. They withdraw. They're not present. They are simply relied on or taken for granted. This is what Heidegger's tool analysis is about in Being in Time, his major work of 1927. Now, uh, sometimes this is read simply as Heidegger showing us that all perception and all theory emerges out of a practical background. As I see it, that doesn't go deep enough. <laughs> because if you think about it, our practical use of things translates or distorts them just as much as our looking at them. So if I look at a chair and try to describe it, uh, there are certain things about the chair I'm never going to get because I'm not a mosquito, I'm not a dog, I can't smell that chair the way they can. I can't smell whatever is on those stains on those chairs. There are an infinite number of features in the chair of which I, as a human being, a limited, finite human being, can only grasp certain ones. And so actually, there's something deeper than theory and practice, if you read Heidegger the right way. There's something deeper uh, than either of those. That is the, the withdrawn, Heidegger calls it, that which is withdrawn from any possible access. It's something we can allude to indirectly, something we can approximate, but not something we can ever bring directly before the mind. There's, there's a kernel of something unknowable in every entity in the universe. That's Heidegger. And so uh, we talked about how at Husserl there's a tension between object and qualities, and it's the, at the level of appearance. In Heidegger, there is an object that is not at the level of appearance. It's somewhere deeper. And there are also qualities there. So you have two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. There's the objects that appear, the objects that withdraw from appearance. The qualities that appear, the qualities that withdraw from appearance. It's a very elegant fourfold structure you get when you look at these two philosophers together. And since there are two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities, you draw lines between them and you can do very interesting things 
uh, with the different relations between the objects and qualities, but I'm only going to talk about one of those today. I'm going to talk about the relation between real objects, which withdraw from direct access, and the sensual qualities, the qualities that appear, because this is what I think uh, is the relevant tension for aesthetics, for art, for architecture. The idea that the qualities of the thing are directly visible to us, but in the case of beauty, the object is not directly visible to us. Somehow the object eludes us. It goes to a deeper level than the qualities that are on the surface. And I'll give you an example of why I think this. One example is metaphor. And I'll talk about similes here, a special case of metaphor. And let's talk about uh, two specific features of metaphor. One of them is that metaphors can't be too similar or too dis dissimilar, or they don't work. They have to be somewhere in between. So if I say a pen is like a pencil, it's not really a metaphor, right? Because I guess some Dada as a genius could make it a metaphor, given the right surroundings. But most of the time, that's not going to be a metaphor. That's going to be a literal statement of identity because the, the two terms are so close that we'd use both of them for writing. Uh, we're immediately going to think of that as uh, a literal identity. And what that means is the pen and the pencil have similar qualities. I define the literal as that which uh, treats things as nothing but qualities. And when you say a pen is like a pencil, it's a little statement, a literal statement because you're saying here are two objects that have very similar qualities. <clears throat> or if I say a euro is worth whatever it's worth now in dollars, dollar twenty-four, let's say I don't, I haven't checked that in a while. Um, that's a literal statement. You're saying a, a euro can be converted into a dollar twenty-four cents or whatever the current rate is. Um, so that's that's too similar to be a metaphor. You can also think of a statement that is too dissimilar to work as a metaphor. Uh, the, one example from the the literary critic Andrei Verminsky was um, drinking a milkshake is like drawing an isosceles triangle. Okay, again, some poetic genius could make this work, but most of the time it's not going to work as a metaphor. It's, it's, there's no way for us to put drinking a milkshake and drawing an isosceles triangle together in any compelling way for most of us most of the time. But let's consider one that's a little closer. And the one I mentioned yesterday is Homer's famous example, Wine Dark Sea in the Odyssey, the Wine Dark Sea. Well, there's something about those two, the relative color, that makes them comparable. And yet that's not all that's going on in the metaphor. He's not making a literal statement and saying, hey, have you ever noticed that the Mediterranean Sea is approximately the same color as a lot of kinds of wine? That'd be kind of a trite observation. It, wouldn't, it doesn't do the work of a metaphor. What's happening in the metaphor is that the color, the somewhat identical color, is used as a pretext to bring them together and bring along all the other qualities of the wine and ascribe them to the sea. As I mentioned, drunkenness, oblivion, danger, intoxication, uh, all of these features that usually go with wine are ascribed to the, the Mediterranean Sea instead. Okay, there's a second fact about metaphor that I wanted to mention, which is that it's not reversible in the way that literal statements are. Since literal statements are simply comparing the qualities of two things, it doesn't matter which thing you mention first. You can say a pen is like a pencil, a pencil is like a pen. Right? Doesn't matter. In both cases, there's a bundle of qualities that unifies those two things. But now try taking Homer's wine dark sea and reversing it into sea dark wine. It's still a metaphor. Maybe it's an equally good one, but it's not the same metaphor. When you're talking about the wine dark sea, you are ascribing wine qualities to the sea. When you talk about sea dark wine, you're taking the qualities of the sea and giving them to the wine, leading to a completely different result. The entity that's created is entirely different. And why is that? It's because metaphors instantiate that tension between objects and qualities I was talking about. One of the terms in the simile is treated as the object pole, the other is provides the qualities pole. And so they're not reversible for that reason. Now, what happens, though, when we say wine dark sea? The wine dark qualities are still there, obviously, because we understand the metaphor, but we cannot really imagine, we cannot really imagine what a wine dark sea would be like. That object, the sea, changes from a phenomenal object into a real one, a real withdrawn object, because we can't get at it. It becomes like Kant's thing in itself. We don't know what a wine dark sea would be like. We try, we allude to it, we... We try to put ourselves in its shoes, but we can't directly uh, get at it. So there seem to be just qualities floating in a void, these wine-dark qualities with no objects since the object has vanished, the sea has vanished. 
but that's impossible. Uh, for reasons I won't get into, phenomenology has shown that objects and qualities always come together. There are no bare objects with no qualities. There are no qualities without an object. So what is the object in that case? What is the object if the seed disappears? My argument is that I myself become the object. I myself have to replace the C that vanishes. I myself become a kind of method actor, playing the C, playing the wine dark qualities. This is why aesthetic experience is more gripping than literal uh, truths are, right? Because we have to invest ourselves in somehow trying to perform the mental labor of producing this wine dark C. We have to become the wine dark C. This is why I say that all aesthetics has a theatrical structure, whereas the art critic Michael Fried says the opposite. He says uh, theat theatricality is the ruin of aesthetics. I'll get to Fried a bit later and show why I, I disagree on that point. But I say that theatricality is the roots of aesthetics, and this is why I just have a theory here. I have no empirical evidence. I have a theory that the first artwork was the mask. Uh, cave paintings are the oldest ones we have because cave paintings can keep. Masks tend to be made of leather and other things that decay, so we're never going to find ancient masks. But because of the theatrical structure of aesthetics, I think the mask was probably the first uh, artwork. And I, I had some strange insight into this. One year for a Halloween party, I went at the last minute to the costume store, and one of the only things left was this really scary zebra mask from Tanzania. Uh, it looked like a, a zebra had risen from the dead. There were these smoky ch charcoal outlines around the eyes, and then I did some other things. I put some adhesive tape stripes on a black turtleneck, and I ended up winning the prize for best costume. What I didn't realize is that my parents' dogs would be terrified by this mask. Uh, when I put this mask on, they thought I was transformed, right? I still smell the same, they know who I am, yet they barked as though an actual zebra monster, anthropomorphic zebra monster had come into the house. And one of the dogs even jumped up and knocked the mask off my face. And this reminded me of the, the really deep primordial power of masks and the way that children think they transform themselves when they put on a Batman mask. So that's just a side note. Uh, to get back to the main point, I would say that the ugly is also theatrical, simply in an unpleasant sense. And this is why I think the beautiful and the ugly are not opposites. Now, um, the reason I say aesthetics is for philosophy is because I say the object quality tension is central to philosophy. Philosophy for me is really about understanding the way in which objects and qualities both relate to each other and are disjunct from each other. I think a lot of things can be explained this way through the four different pairings of objects and qualities, and I will call all four of those aesthetics. And uh, philosophy, like art, is the opposite of literalism, and thus it is more art than science, I would say. Um, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, I think you can, you, can, you can know a thing by talking about what it's made of or what it does, right? It's helpful to know if someone asks me, oh, you're at the American University in Cairo, what is the American University in Cairo? I can either talk about what it's made of, meaning it's buildings, it's different schools. I can talk about the historical backstory that it started as this kind of American missionary thing, trying to convert Egyptians to Christianity, and then it evolved into a more serious academic institution. Or I can go the other direction and talk about what it does, what kind of impact it has on Egyptian society, how many majors it has, what its students do after they graduate. And that's helpful. That's, that's helpful, and yet neither of those really get at the university, because the university is more than its parts. It has emergent properties that can't be explained by its parts, and it's also capable of other effects than the ones it's having right now. It's something deeper than its current effects because of the other effects it might have. So any object is going to be a, a middle point, a third table. It, uh, you mentioned that essay. Different from its parts or its effects. Uh, to try to know a thing is to try to exhaust it in terms of those two kinds of uh, reduction, downward and upward reduction, which I call undermining and overmining. Uh, I say that art is trying to get at the midpoint between those two, as I argued in the essay, The Third Table, that an artist is not going to tell you, they might tell you, but the primary point of an artwork is not, oh, it's made of 78% canvas, 21% pigment, and 1% something else. Nor is it, this artwork is equivalent to how it makes me feel. Right, because you can keep going back to the artwork and have different feelings because the artwork is something deeper than your feelings here and now. Um, infinitely many possible interpretations can be given of, of um, a, very, uh, a specific painting. So the, the painting is not equivalent to any of its interpretations or even the sum of all the interpretations. Uh, some art is obviously political, like Picasso's Guernica, which was a protest of the bombing of the town in the Basque region of Spain during the Spanish Civil War, and yet I still think 500 years from now, when the details of the Spanish War are probably almost completely forgotten, 
there will still be an aesthetic response to that painting because there's something in it that is more than the specific protest message it was conveying. And I say that philosophy does the same thing because, as I mentioned, uh, philosophia means love of wisdom. It doesn't mean wisdom. And Socrates never comes up with a literal definition of anything. He, he kind of circles around it, gets closer to defining what friendship or virtue or love really mean. But there's no dialogue in which he reaches an answer. And that's not just because he's being ironic or contrarian. It's because, in a sense, you can't really give an accurate definition of anything. A thing is not equal to its definition. Aristotle put this in an interesting way. Aristotle said you can't define an individual thing because individual things are concrete and definitions use language which is made of universals. So you can't define Socrates in the way that you can define white or just or beautiful. Maybe you can't even do it in those cases, but you certainly cannot define an individual thing like Socrates. So I see philosophy and the arts as closer cousins than is sometimes believed, but given the great uh, history of successes of the sciences since the scientific revolution, uh, philosophy has tried to be more and more like a science, and I think that has the wrong aspiration for philosophy. The philosophy should model itself more on the aesthetic model. Okay, uh, some other things that are not literalizable. Jokes. Okay, you can explain jokes, but as soon as you've explained the joke, it's like putting a globe on a two-dimensional map. You've, you've changed it. Um, you don't necessarily spoil it, but you've transformed it into something else. So let's imagine you hear the joke, um, you know, I don't know if outside America, do people have all these, how many X's does it take to screw in a light bulb? It's kind of a stock American joke. How many bureaucrats does it take to screw in a light bulb? And then there's some funny punchline at the end. Well, here's a weird one. How many surrealists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Fish. Okay, you, you're, some of you are chuckling. Now, let's, let's say you have a small child, and the child says, Daddy, I don't get it, and you have to explain it to them. And then you have to say something like, well, the surrealists were artists who put objects in places where you would never expect them. And who would ever expect the word fish at the end of a screw in the light bulb joke? So see, it's very, uh, very appropriate. Now, maybe your child understands it, but it's, it's not a joke in that format, right? So that's another case where you can't really literalize it. I mentioned threats already. Uh, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, as in The Godfather. To literalize that threat, to give it any tangible form, is never as scary as the vague form of an offer you can't refuse. Um, magic tricks, right? There's, I'm not a magician, but I, I read some time ago that there's a sort of unspoken agreement among international magicians that you never teach the secret of the tricks to non-magicians. You just don't do it, right? Because then you're, you're undermining your own craft. And there's always some very easy literal trick you can play with your hands or misdirection by doing something with your left hand while telling them to look at your right. Um, but to literalize the magic trick, it, it's no longer magic. And I also mentioned rhetoric, right? The rhetoric uh, deliberately leaves things unstated in a way that has a certain powerful effect that becomes less powerful if you state it, right? That if you, you know, Freud had this insight too, that the, the point of the talking cure is that by taking some sort of repression and putting it in words, you've eliminated the repression somehow, right? And you've become cured in this way. Whether that's true or not, uh, there's a sense in which making something explicit does not always make it better or more powerful. As with the example from Aristotle, this man has been three times crowned with laurel, means this man has won the Olympic Games three times, but it's more powerful to say it indirectly. This man has been three times crowned with laurel. And Marshall McLuhan points out that the media in which we live are always invisible, and they only become visible once they're cliches, once they're in the past, all right? Um, now, I want to talk about a different issue. I've talked about the literal and the theatrical and how I think that art has to be theatrical, but it cannot be literal. Right? The literal is to reduce a thing to the qualities that it contains, whereas I say that art is about the separation between the hidden object and its visible qualities. And um, theatrical, I think, is necessary because in the aesthetic case, the object always disappears. We have to replace it, and therefore we have to involve ourselves in the creation of the aesthetic object, we as the spectator or the beholder, as Fried calls it. Now, I want to talk about another uh, major term in aesthetics that no one seems to agree on what it means, and that is formalism, except that people tend not to like formalism these days, although it's, it's making a comeback, kind of like beauty. We're going to do a formalism conference in Los Angeles in the spring, kind of an attempt to revive it. In literary criticism, it's coming back. Uh, Caroline Levine has written a beautiful book that I recommend on forms in the study of literature. What does formalism mean? And by the way, I, I, for the most part, think of formalism as a good term. Formal, formalism, I think, is best defined 
through Kant again, Kant being the dominant modern philosopher. Kant, despite having died in 1804, in philosophy we still live in his shadow in many ways. And even if you disagree with him, you have to work your way through him. As far as I can tell, the only part of Kant's philosophy in which he uses the term formalism is his ethics. And you may know a bit about Kant's ethics. Kant's ethics uh, require that an act be ethical in its own rights. We're not judging an action according to its consequences. We are judging it according to whether it is consistent with the, the duty of a universal, uh, sorry, a, a rational being. Um, before you perform an action, you are supposed to think, what if everyone were to act the way I'm acting now all the time? So before you lie, think, what if everyone were, were lying all the time? Communication would, come, would become impossible. That's one formulation of Kant's categorical imperative. Um, most of us, I think, would be willing to lie to save somebody's life, say, in a despotic state. You're hiding a political prisoner in your house. The police come to your door and ask, is the person being hidden in your house? Most of us, I think, would consider it a moral virtue to lie to save the person, but not for Kant. Uh, in Kant's case, I suppose the most you could say is, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question, which, of course, means the person's going to be captured and died. Well, um, that's, that's one example of what he means by formalism. You're abstracting an action from its consequences. An action is not ethical if you're doing it to go to heaven or avoid going to hell. It's not ethical if you're doing it so you can sleep at night with a good conscience or if you want a good reputation in the community, or even if you're doing it out of warmth. Someone who helps people because, hey, they just love their fellow man, and hey, brother, of course I'll give you the money you need, and slaps them on the back. That person is less admirably ethical for Kant than a kind of flinty person who says, I take no pleasure in it, but it is my duty as a universal free agent to give you this money on this occasion. That person is actually better for Kant than the person who's motivated by warmth and friendship. Okay, so he calls that formalism because the ethical action is cut off from its circumstances. It is judged in its own rights without connection to what's going on around it. Now, he doesn't use formalism in the other two parts of his philosophy, but it's still there. And Kant is often considered the godfather of aesthetic formalism, even though I have found no place where he uses that term in his work on art, the critique of judgment. It's still totally applicable, because what does formalism in art usually mean? There are different definitions, but the primary meaning of formalism in the arts is the idea that the artwork has a certain autonomy from its socio-political surroundings, from the biography of the artist. You approach the work of art on its own terms. You don't try to explain it in terms of the class structure in Victorian England at the time it was written. Or maybe you can do that a little bit, but that's not the main meaning of the artwork. The artwork can travel across time and space. It's a unit. And so, of course, formalism comes under attack from the political left, from uh, post-1960s artists, all of who have various reasons to be against formalism. Now, one reason that a certain kind of formalism has to be true, I say, is because nothing absorbs all aspects of its environment. Consider architecture. Architecture is one of those arts that has to be site-specific, right? Because the architect has to take into account the other buildings that are around, the sunlight at certain times of day, the historical resonances of the site. You know, it would be offensive to build certain things on certain sites because of historical sensitivities and, and so forth. But notice that even a site-specific building is not completely site-specific. The architect is making a decision, a conscious decision, about which seven or eight aspects of the site are relevant to this building, while excluding others. There is no such thing as absolute site specificity, whether in architecture or any other art. So if you try to read um, um, Shakespeare's plays as a typical product of Elizabethan England, let's say, you've got some problems ahead of you. You first of all have to explain why Shakespeare's plays are different from those of other Elizabethan playwrights. You have to explain um, why Shakespeare's plays are different from prison records and census registries of the time. And, and also why only certain aspects of Elizabethan England come into Shakespeare's plays while others are, are excluded, no doubt. So that's, I think, the grain of truth in formalism. However, there is a problem with Kant's specific version of formalism. He's not just talking about the, the separation of anything from its environment, he's talking about a very specific separation, the separation of the human from everything else, the typical modern separation. You've got human thought here, and you've got everything else there. Kant doesn't mind if hydrogen atoms mix with oxygen atoms to form water, of course. He only minds if the human combines with the artwork, because then it's no longer disinterested. Then it's something that's giving us pleasure or is agreeable to us. Like, OK, I'm from Iowa. What if I were to say that Field of Dreams, that baseball movie from Iowa, is the greatest movie in the history of cinema? You'd say I'm biased. I just like it because it's in Iowa, right? It's, it's filmed close to where I grew up. 
Uh, and you'd be right, it's not the greatest film of all time. It's kind of a charming, semi-lightweight piece of entertainment. It's, it's, it's a charming, pleasant movie, but it's not one of the cinematic masterpieces. So for Kant, aesthetic uh, perception has to be disinterested. It cannot be that something is merely agreeable for me. It has to be beautiful in the sense that I think everyone else should find it beautiful. Why does Kant uh, focus so much on that human world uh, separation? Well, I've, I've mentioned that modern philosophy is all about that. Modern philosophy is all about the absolute gap between human thought over here and everything else on the other hand, which is why modern philosophy does such a, a bad job with animals. It doesn't know where to put animals. Are animals on our side or are animals on the dead matter side? Descartes thought that animals were on the dead matter side. So you can torture a monkey with a knife, and if it screams, it doesn't matter because it's just like a machine that needs grease. That's the, the most inhumane version of the principle. But no modern philosophers really do a very good job with animals. No one's sure where to put them on the mind-body continuum. They're kind of somewhere in between, and no one knows what to do with them. All right. Now, um, this played a, an important role in 20th century formalist art criticism because uh, I mentioned Clement Greenberg. I'll also mention Michael Fried, his one-time disciple, who were two, probably the two most influential formalist art critics of the 20th century. And they have something in common with Kant, which is that they don't like the human getting too mixed up in the artwork. They want a separation there, just as Kant did. And this means, of course, that they were rather prejudiced against the kind of art that emerged from the 1960s onward that is often called postmodern and that involves things like performance and happenings and conceptual art and land art. Uh, because for them it violated this formalist principle that the human and the work have to be separated above all else. But an interesting thing happens in uh, Freed's career. Um, if you know Freed's work at all, Freed began as an art critic and he criticized minimalist arts in the 1960s because he said it was theatrical. It was trying to provoke a reaction out of the beholder rather than remaining at a distance from us, which he thought was a bad thing. And then art was going in a direction he didn't like, so he turned into an art historian rather than a critic. He didn't want to just be a permanent scold and keep ripping on post-1960s art forever. He decided to become a historian. And he found a prominent ally in the person of Denis Diderot, the French philosopher who was also, it turns out, a formidable art critic in the 1700s. And it turns out that Diderot, like Freed, was an anti-theatrical critic. He, he liked painters in the 1700s who showed the characters absorbed in their activities rather than trying to put on a show for us, rather than hamming it up. The characters are involved in what they're doing. And he admits that it's sometimes hard to tell when that's happening and when it's not, and some paintings are ambiguous that way. And it looked as though Freed was going to just do a history showing how all the artists he liked in the past were anti-theatrical just like him. However, Freed has a lot of intellectual integrity, and his research has led him in a very different direction. It led him to the opposite of his initial intuitions, uh, culminating in his work on Edward Manet, who many people think was the first modern painter. And Freed finds himself having to admit that, wow, Manet isn't entirely an anti-theatrical artist, because if you look at his paintings, there's always one figure who's turning and staring right at you. It's almost flouting the anti-theatrical law that Freed otherwise likes. And so in spite of himself, Freed ends up having to admit that there is something theatrical about art. It's only a, a, a kind of illusion. What is it? A supreme fiction, he calls it. A supreme fiction, the idea that the characters in the painting are doing what they're doing and we're not watching them, because of course we're watching them. It's a painting, right? And he begins to admit that more and more as his career goes on. And finally, he can't really separate between theatricality and anti-theatricality as he wanted to. He's one case where the clear opposition between the human beholder and the work breaks down and they fuse together. I can think of two others. There's one for Kant's ethics and one for Kant's metaphysics. The case of Kant's ethics is the very colorful German philosopher Max Scheler. In personality terms, the Zizek of his era. He was always in the tabloids and so forth because of his behavior. Uh, but he said Kant is, is absolutely right that actions are cut off from their surroundings and have to be judged on their own terms. Nonetheless, he said, Kant is wrong to think that ethics happens solely on the side of human thoughts. Ethics, he said, is, is built of our relation to objects, objects that we love or hate. And each of us have different orderings of objects that we love and hate. He called it the ordo amoris, the ordering of loves. And it's not entirely subjective because somebody can love the wrong things. Somebody can love the dark side of life too much, and we can ethically judge that person, and yet we can still describe 
their preferences in terms of preference for shady underworld lifestyles. Um, the point is that Shaler thinks the unit of ethics is not the human being. The unit of ethics is the fusion of the human being with the objects in the world. So this is his step past Kant. The idea that human and world are not two separate realms that can't be bridged. They're always coming as a pair. And this is how he wants to do ethics. And then Bruno Latour, uh, who is actually my favorite living philosopher, what does Latour say? Latour says that modernity is the failed attempt to separate the nature side from the culture side. Uh, in fact, you can't do this. He says there are many hybrids. There are many things like the ozone hole. Is it natural or socially constructed? Well, it's both, right? Because we helped create it with our misuse of certain chemicals, but it's also part of nature. It's there, it's causing skin cancer in Australia and so forth. So you can't really pin it down as natural or cultural. That's not really a relevant uh, opposition anymore for Latour. I would say that Latour goes a little too far in his solution. Latour ends up saying effectively that everything's a hybrid. Everything is a mixture of, of natural and cultural. The problem with that is it leaves human thought on the scene as one of the two important building blocks of the universe. Whereas I would say that human thought is just one object like trillions of others. It's one that's important to us, but not necessarily that important in the grand scheme of the universe. But no, Latour says the human element is always there in every object, which is why he sometimes goes a little too far and says things like this. Some Egyptologists discovered that Ramses II died of tuberculosis. They x-rayed his mummy and found that he had evidence of tuberculosis in his mummy. Latour says, that's ridiculous. Tuberculosis wasn't even discovered in ancient Egypt. So how could he have died of tuberculosis? That's like saying he died of automatic weapons fire. That didn't exist then either. And you can see why scientists don't like Latour much, right? Because he wants to bring the human element into every situation. So in a way, he's repeating the modernist divide. He's simply doing it by combining the two poles of modernity so that nothing exists without the human element. I think that's going too far, but it's, it's a, still a step beyond Kant in some way. I want to say something briefly about the sublime, because when people talk about Kant's aesthetics, they often shift too quickly to a discussion of the sublime. Kant talks about two kinds of the sublime, the, the mathematical and the, the dynamical. The mathematical sublime is something that is absolutely large compared to the human scale. The dynamical sublime is something absolutely powerful compared to the human scale. So mathematical sublime, think of the giant, uh, the starry sky, the expanse of the starry sky on a dark night somewhere. Uh, the dynamical sublime, think of those films of the tsunami in Japan in 2011. Um, in both of those cases, we feel utterly overpowered by the thing that's there. And so some people will say, hey, object-oriented ontology, it sounds like you're interested in the sublime, when you should be more interested in the beautiful. But remember, the beautiful for Kant is already untranslatable into conceptual terms. That's his version of beauty. It's something you can never paraphrase. And so you don't really need to go to the sublime to get that. The problem with the sublime is his treatment of it as an infinity. What's the problem with that? Well, one thing is that all infinities end up becoming the same from that standpoint, because everything that's absolutely larger than the human scale becomes sublime in the same sense. Whether you're thinking of a black hole or a tsunami or a, a hurricane, it's hard to distinguish between those three because they're all absolutely overpowering or large compared to human beings. The best criticism of this I've seen is by Timothy Morton in his book, Hyperobjects, which some of you might know. He has a very powerful argument in there that sometimes large finite quantities are more threatening than infinite ones. To talk about infinity, he says, is a way of priding yourself on your conceptual prowess. Hey, I'm thinking the infinite but try counting up to 100,000. That's actually much harder than saying, I'm thinking the infinite. Try thinking of, of how long it's going to take for plutonium to decay at waste sites, or how long a pla your plastic cup that you use for 10 minutes is going to take to biodegrade in a landfill somewhere. So ecology, he says, is all about these hyper objects, things that are just very, very large compared to the human scale, not absolutely large or infinite. And he gives one fascinating example of a hyper object. I wish I could remember the name of this artist. Some artists um, attached some microphones to his window pane in Manhattan and recorded, I think, a week or two weeks of sound. And then he sped it up, I don't know, 100 times. So you're hearing, you're hearing a week of Manhattan noise at 100 times the speed. And as expected, you know, the cars honking sound like insects chirping. That's not a surprise. The really weird thing is there's this strange droning sound in the background, you know, like that. Turns out, you know what it was? It was the standing pressure wave over the Atlantic Ocean that changes its tone so gradually that we never notice it. So Pythagoras was right. There is a kind of music of the spheres. It's the music of the Atlantic Ocean. 
And Pythagoras said about the, the music of the planets that we're used to it and so we never hear it. Turns out that's right, uh, that when you speed up the pressure wave over the Atlantic, uh, you can hear it. It's a hyper object. All right, so what I want to distinguish between is two senses of the human. I want to talk about the human as an ingredient and the human as an observer. And I'll tell you why I first thought of this distinction. I thought of it because I was giving a lecture at a conference in France seven years ago. And of course, you know, I'm in the speculative realist philosophy current, and speculative realists want to talk about the world the way it is apart from humans. That, that's, that's the Wikipedia summary of speculative realism. It's not that inaccurate. So the guy asked me, um, what would art without humans be like? Right, because I don't like, I like to talk about things apart from humans. And I didn't have an answer for that. I had to think about it for several weeks before I finally realized it's a wrongly put question. I think asking what art without humans would be like is like asking what basketball or chess without humans would be like. It's not really a meaningful question. Yes, the, I would say that the human is a necessary ingredient of art because art has to be theatrical. But that does not mean that art is equivalent to what the human beholder thinks about the artwork. The artwork has a depth. But the artwork, I would say, is not the work and it's not my mind. It's a compound made of the work and my mind, just like Water is a compound made of hydrogen and oxygen. It's just that the human is in one of the ingredients of this particular compound. And that needs to be distinguished from the human as the one who observes the artwork and criticizes it or comments upon it. I'll give you an analogy. Manuel Delanda's book, uh, A New Philosophy of Society, begins on a very interesting note. Delanda says, this book, I want to give a realist philosophy of society, which means a philosophy of society apart from humans. And he says, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, that's nonsense, right? Society consists of humans. And so therefore, you can't talk about a society apart from humans. And he says, right, of course. But society is still independent of humans in the sense that society is not equivalent to what sociologists say about it. Soci uh, society is a real thing. And sociologists try to study it. And they can be right or wrong, just like any other scientist can. There's a real object called society that is not just equivalent to what sociologists say about society. And I would say the same about arts as about society. Just as with society, humans are a necessary theatrical ingredient of arts. It does not follow that humans have the power to plumb the depths of an artwork, right? Because the artwork cannot be literalized. It's something that cannot be exhausted by any human description. It's something we can allude to. Sometimes people make the objection of negative theology at this point. They say, if you say you can't say what the artwork is, aren't you just saying that you can only say what it's not? Just like in negative theology in the Middle Ages, that you know, God is, does not have a body, God is not, God is not, God is not, without ever saying what God is. Well, the difference is, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not that you have knowledge or you just have mere empty gesticulations and hand-waving. There's something in between. There is a kind of indirect knowledge that we have of things. And this is what philosophia is all about. It's a kind of cognition that is not a knowledge. This is what art, this is what aesthetics, what architecture is all about. You have a kind of implicit or tacit or indirect elusive knowledge of things, meaning it's not a literal kind of knowledge, as with knowledge in the strict sense. It's a kind of cognition without knowledge. And a good deal of our everyday existence consists of this kind of cognition. You get a bad feeling about somebody, right? No, I don't want this guy babysitting my kids. I can't put my finger on it, but I just don't. Everything seems right on the surface, but I get this weird sinking feeling about this guy. Now let's find another babysitter for the kids. Well, you can't literalize what's wrong. Maybe you were maybe you were wrong. Maybe you can never prove why this person isn't fit to babysit your kids for a few hours. But if you have a gut feeling that there's something wrong there, it's a kind of indirect knowledge, more likely than not. Right? It's something telling you that you're not supposed to be heading in this direction. You can't quite put it in words. All right, and much of the great writing in our time or any time is of this sort, right? The word critique has a double sense. Sometimes critique means you're tearing things down in the name of some basic first principle. Like you can do a Marxist critique of any novel and try to reduce any novel to the social conditions of alienation that are visible through the novel. That's one way of looking at critique. Another way of looking at critique, as I mentioned, is food criticism, art criticism, architecture criticism. Um, theater criticism, which is often very poetic, right? It's so, there, there, there can never be a final critique of a certain restaurant or a certain play, right? Because you can never literalize it. Just like there can never be a final accurate projection of the globe onto a two-dimensional map. I see that I'm nearing the end of the time, so I just want to say one last thing. 
What is interesting about architecture for me? And I'll, I'll promise to keep this to two or three minutes. I got five seconds left. Um, the philosopher who dislikes architecture the most is probably Arthur Schopenhauer, who puts it below landscape gardening and on the same level as water fountains. Why? Because architecture deals with non-living materials. And Schopenhauer is the philosopher of the will and life. Um, and so he rates architecture very low. Now Kant, who's the foremost philosopher of aesthetics in the last few centuries, also gives architecture a fairly low place. Why? Because architecture is not free beauty. He mentions some examples of beautiful things that aren't really pure or free beauty. One example being a beautiful human, right? Because that's too intertwined with ulterior motives, say with lust or with jealousy, maybe. There are different human motives that too easily interfere with the judgment of human beauty. Or I mentioned a horse, right? If you're judging a horse as beautiful, it might be because you're imagining you can ride really fast on it. It's got big muscles. It's going to win a race and win you some money, or you're going to ride it really fast to your grandma's house. So beauty of horses is also not a pure kind of beauty. And of course, architecture, right? Because architecture is about utility. If architecture had no utility, it would just be sculpture. If one of these pavilions were never inhabited, at least potentially, it would just be a, a strange abstract sculpture. So architecture for him is, is excluded. However, um, I want to say that architecture has a privileged position for challenging the dominance of Kantian aesthetics precisely because it exposes his flawed assumption that the human and the world are what must be separated. Because in architecture, that's impossible. Right? The utility is always in the thing. That's what makes it, by definition, different from sculpture. And therefore, the ability to think of the utility is somehow built into the object itself, rather than simply contaminating it from the outside, is what will give us a, a, some leverage to move beyond Kant's aesthetics at last. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? You're please, please welcome to raise your hand and then the microphone might be given to you by the lady there. Any question? Anybody is brave enough to ask a question? While they're working up their courage, let me tell one other funny anecdote um, yes. about the relation between philosophy and architecture. And this affects me personally because now I'm working at an architecture school, right? And so I have to justify why am I worth CyArk's money in a salary, right? They decided to bring me. Was it a waste of money or not to bring me to CyArk as a philosopher? Well, um, there's a guy named Fred Sherman or Sharman, teaches at Morgan State University, who had a very interesting tweet thread a few years ago. And it went something like this. It was, it was a sarcastic series of tweets about the relation between philosophy and architecture. And it went in four steps. It said something like, uh, Claude Levi Strauss liked signifiers, so let's build things with historical resonance. That's the first step. Uh, the second one was Derrida liked difference, so let's build buildings that clash and collide. And what was the next one? Oh, Deleuze liked everything to be continuous, so let's build things along gradients rather than with discrete contours. And then I was the fourth one. He said, Graham Harmon likes things that withdraw, so let's build buildings with murky outlines. He left out Heidegger. You could have said something like, um, Heidegger likes Dasein being thrown in the world, so let's build stuff that emphasizes sunlight and wood and stone. Now, the question there is, can there ever be a non-literal relationship between philosophy and architecture? The stakes here are that uh, architecture has gone through a series of influences, I would say three major influences from philosophers in a row. There was he the Heidegger period, the Derrida period, the Deleuze period. Um, whether the triple O period ever reaches that point, we'll see. It's an open question. But uh, the crit criticism often made is that the relationship has been overly literal. So in the case of Delu Deleuze's period from the early 90s to whenever Deleuze wrote a book called The Fold and then architects started putting folds in buildings. Um, is there another way for philosophy and architecture to interact other than that? Because that's basically a pun, isn't it? Oh, folds in philosophy? Let's pick a, put a fold on a building. It's an intellectual pun, because fold doesn't have the same meaning in the two cases. Um, Patrick Schumacher, somebody who he faces a lot of critics, but I have a lot of time for him, because he's always very blunt about what he thinks. He doesn't come out and embrace Deleuze, but you can see a lot of Deleuze in his uh, work, his giant two-volume work on parametricism, he, because he also favors gradients and not 
strictly articulated interiors of buildings in terms of function or program. Um, he also doesn't want there to be a clear dividing line between the building and the environment. In fact, he wants the power to take over the whole city and tear it down and rebuild it in his own style. Everything has to be related to everything else. But then what, what's great about Patrick is he always admits his own flaw. And he says, I admit there's a problem with my theory of architecture. I don't know where to put doors and windows. Because it's completely arbitrary, right? The building is supposed to be this gentle flux and flow, as in some of Zaha's work, Zaha is his former partner. Um, and yet, I don't know where to put the doors and windows. I just have to kind of arbitrarily decide where to put them. Well, that's a pretty big problem, isn't it? That shows a problem with the Deleuzian paradigm uh, for architecture. This idea of the virtual is somehow continuous uh, is a problem when you're working in a field architecture that cannot be entirely continuous. It has to make decisions about where to make certain cuts. Anyway, that's, I just wanted to add that because that's um, an ongoing question for me about the relation between my own profession and the profession by which I am now employed, and very happily so. Okay. Any other? Any brave? Thank you very much, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, I was just asked to announce. Ah, oh, there is a question there. Sorry. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a question about knowing quite a lot about Sayar Crits, by the way, and you've. I'm fascinated that you've added to the Sayak situation there, which is very interesting and complex. I'd like to ask you about resonance. I think there's a certain issue which fascinates me that's being prompted by the various conversations uh, yesterday and today, which is to do with the moment, there's a sort of magic, speaking as a designer, there's a magic moment that sometimes occurs to you, and another sort of magic moment that sometimes occurs to a body of people who either you respect or don't respect, or even in, in the performance of a crit, there's a certain moment when suddenly something beyond the project, but of the project, is, is buzzing around, and then it's, usually it's lost. In parallel, I think one can report that there's also an analysis that can be made of the magic moment of a project. Is it the first scribble? Is it the second scribble? Is it the, is it the computer analyzing it? Is it the skeletal structure? Is it the clad structure? Or did it lost? Or did it only found? And I'm fascinated by that as both a teacher and a little little bit. Um, I think these two things are very intriguing because what, again, we seem to be discussing in many of the discussions is the thing, the finite, whether it's the finite, whether it has other values, whether, as in the first thing this morning, whether there are two different positions on process. But in the end, I think more than all of this is what I call the magic moment. And it sometimes exists only in the mind. Sometimes it can be felt by the designer, though probably not by anybody else. And sometimes, as I would say, it can occur in discussion and criticism. I don't really have any. I, I agree with the magic moment reading of projects and also, I would say, of intellectual careers and also of history. And this is, I think, a great argument against continuism, the idea that everything is kind of gradual. I think there are certain moments when things change. And uh, you know, there are any number of examples. Um, you know, in architectural projects, I'm sure there's a moment when some one thing happens that transforms the project into something that has a life of its own, something that takes a quantum leap from where it was before. Um, I remember reading, I, I like reading about Einstein's uh, search for general relativity for the equations of general relativity. And there was this key moment when he decided that uh, gravity and acceleration and moving on a curve are all somehow equivalent. This allowed him insights into the idea of gravity as a curvature of, of space-time. Um, that, that's a kind of step forward in human intellectual history. Uh, when, when Michael Fried came to SciArc, he talked about Anthony Caro's sculpture, Midday, and I don't have a slide of it here for you, but he, there's one final slight tilt of one of the pieces of metal that Fried thinks is the key that brings the sculpture to life. Um, since there was a lot of Philip Glass music playing yesterday, I, I just thought of an example from Philip Glass. I read his autobiography at one point, and the key moment for him, oddly enough, is that when he was a music student in Paris, he was hired to transcribe some Indian music being played for a film by Ravi Shankar and Alaraka in a studio. And he's writing it down, and, and uh, Alaraka kept shouting at him, all the notes are equal, all the notes are equal. And Philip Glass, the young Philip Glass, didn't understand what this meant. And he had to figure it out on the fly. What it meant 
is that, of course, in Western music, you split everything into measures, right? If it's three-four time, you split every measure into three notes, and you're always kind of emphasizing the first note of the measure. Whereas in Indian music, it turns out, you're not doing it that way. You're synthesizing. You're stringing together phrases. You're not taking time and cutting it up into even pieces. You're taking a five-beat uh, five phrase and linking it with a seven-beat phrase to a three-beat phrase. And so what he, what he decided was that he would just write the music without the bars. And then it sounded the way the Indians wanted it to sound, right? Because that's, they didn't want that emphasis on the first note every time. And now that's how Philip Glass writes his music. There's no, measure, there's no measures if you look at how his music written out. It's just notes written after notes after notes. So it was that strange fusion with, with Indian music. Or in the case of Delta Blues in Mississippi, it was that fusion with Hawaiian music, the bottleneck on the guitar. I was actually borrowed from Hawaii. Even though we want to think of it as an indigenous black southern music, there's cross hybridization between cultures. It's Hawaiian music that took it to another level. In fact, I think it's often, um, I call it a symbiosis with something else outside that creates that magic moment. Um, if you don't all know Lynn Margulis, you should. Uh, great evolutionary biologist who died, unfortunately, a few years ago unexpectedly. Uh, she began as a maverick graduate student in the 1960s, suggesting that the human cell originally emerged as a symbiosis of independent organisms. And she couldn't prove it at the time, but she said, if we could ever analyze the DNA of the cell, this is the 1960s, so it was impossible. She said, we will find that some of the structures of our cell are not coded in the DNA because they came from outside. They were viruses or bacteria that just got reproduced along with our thing. And she reads evolution in this way. She even asked as a graduate student, when did we see evolution happen in a laboratory? Are there any examples? And her professors told her just one. And the example was they took a tank of fruit flies, split it down the middle, and on one half of the tank, they slowly raised the temperature. The other half, they slowly lowered the temperature. And after however many generations, the fruit flies could no longer interbreed. So they were effectively different species. And then they dissected the poor things, and they said, oh, the experiment's tainted because the hot fruit flies have a virus. And she said, that's the whole point, don't you see? The reason they could survive the heat is because they made a symbiosis with the virus. And it divided along with their cell, and the virus became a new part of the fruit fly, new part of its own body. And so actually, the fruit fly is now fruit fly plus virus. That's what the hot fruit fly is. It's a, it's a conjunction of previously separate life forms. And I think you can uh, see this in terms of history. I wrote a book called Immaterialism that was all about the Dutch East India Company where I tried to break down the history of that company, which is the world's first corporation, uh, into five or six finite, discrete moments where it shifted its reality in some way. So that all the other stuff that it happens, all the large battles and noisy trade deals it makes are, are actually just noise compared with five or six simple transformations. And I got that idea from actually thinking about my own life and other human lives. I read an anthropological study where they studied people from big cities and people from villages in the Amazon and found that we all have about the same number of decisive experiences in our life. People might fall in love twice. They might have two really good friends. You know, it's one to three in each of these categories. One or three great insights in their life that change who they are. And it doesn't matter where you grow up, what kind of society. You have about the same number. We have only a finite number of sockets in our brain that stuff can fit into. And the lesson of that experiment was don't try to grow up too fast but there are other possible lessons you could draw from that. And one of them is that um, this idea that sometimes there's this false debate in philosophy. Am I, one, am I one person, am I one soul, one self that lives from birth to death, and maybe before and after, if you believe that? Or am I many? Am I constantly in flux, constantly changing? I think both of those run against the evidence. What we know is that there are certain decisive moments in your life. They tend to happen in your youth, after which you reach mature form and reach a kind of fixed character where things don't affect you quite as much as they did at first. And what, what makes these things happen? What makes these decisive moments in your life happen? It's not because you're sitting around in your bedroom brooding about who am I, how do I find myself? It's something outside you. It's a person, it's an institution, it's a profession, it's a favorite book, a favorite piece of music. You form a kind of conjunction or a symbiosis with these things that is irreversible. You are not the same person after as you were before. The time is not symmetrical. You can't go backwards to what you, for me, for example, Cairo. I was in Egypt for 16 years. I am not the same person I was before. So many things about me changed. I can never go back to being the person I was before Egypt. And of course, that's not true of Egypt with respect to me, right? Egypt's been there for thousands of years. I don't matter to Egypt, but Egypt matters a great deal to me. Um, and 
I thought of all this because of what you said about the magic moment, and I may have misunderstood your intention, but what I understood you to mean is that um, there comes a break or a cut in the moment of any project or any process where there's really a big difference between before and after. Did you mean something different from that? Slightly more than that, that okay. it, there's a moment of, of greater intensity. It may not change, but you have an awareness of it, or you have a, a greater number of values that suddenly come to your mind or come to other people's mind. And sometimes that is lost, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not always, but sometimes. Yeah. And it comes in also some discussion. That's why I drew the analogy with the, the reviews at SIOC or somewhere, where there can be a certain conglomeration of people that that get, get something in the project or are stimulated by yeah. something in the project. Again, that can be lost and sometimes not even appreciated by the person who made the project, interestingly. Cyarch's an exciting place to be right now and it does feel like a critical mass is there and oddly enough, Los Angeles is having similar moments. Los Angeles used to be viewed as this kind of frivolous place in the American cultural scene and suddenly we get all the exiles from New York and so this might have something to do with critical mass as well. And I just remember another example. Um, one of the best nonfiction books I've ever read, and many people agree, is Richard Rhodes' The Making of the Atomic Bomb. You can, from that book, you can learn not only about the history of the Manhattan Project, you can also learn a lot about early 20th century physics, because he, he's competent in that area too. He tells you everything. And one of the weirdest moments in that book, one of the key moments in the entire history, is when Enrico Fermi is doing an experiment in Rome before he has to leave because of fascism. And everybody's trying to make the neutrons go f as fast as possible to split the atom. And suddenly there comes a moment when, when Fermi realizes, no, you have to slow down the neutron. Because if you do it too fast, it passes right through the atom and it won't split it. So you need to slow it down. And so he starts passing the neutrons not through aluminum, but through wax. It's weird. And that suddenly there's a gestalt shift uh, where the project looks entirely different. Everybody's been assuming that it's in one way. Nobody ever thought about it, that maybe you should slow it down. And um, that is the moment when everything reverses. And of course, you can't predict these things in advance. Otherwise, anybody could manufacture a revolution anytime they want. We could say, oh, what's worked to revolutionize philosophy in the past? Let's do it again. Won't necessarily work, right? Because you can't produce a revolution by criteria. Every situation is different, and sometimes things happen where you least expect them. I think, see my time is up. Oh, sure. I was wondering what is your position towards um, style? Yeah. Because I have the sense that is perhaps what sits between the beautiful and the literal in the yeah. sense that, and I don't mean style as in like what an individual develops as a personal style, but style as in like um, the styles in art history as, as something that, and, and the way in which the styles are generated now in which we all learn to understand this uh, aesthetic or this visual uh, language quite fast um, and without necessarily attaching words to it? Great question, and I'm in total agreement about style, and I do have some things to say about it. Um, individual style does have something to do with it, as do period styles. Um, I, I once knew a sculptor who said there's no such thing as an artistic style, uh, that a style is kind of the retroactive product of, you look at all the works an artist produced in their lifetime and then you deduce commonalities. I think that's false. There is a definite style. You can recognize a previously unknown work as belonging to a certain artist or another. You might be wrong sometimes, but within certain limits you can do that. Um, it, it could be that there was a previously unknown Shakespeare tragedy that would appear and you would say either, oh, that's really Shakespeare's style or it's not, right? That, that, um, and this happens whenever Jackson Pollock paintings show up at flea markets or alleged Jackson Pollock paintings show up at flea markets. You have to decide if that's really Pollock's style or not. So, or Vermeer's style, or whoever's. I think that's because the style is something deeper than the individual works that it produces. Uh, Maurice Miller-Ponty talks about every object as having a style, because an object is never fully visible in all of its profiles, but uh, this is obvious in the case of places. There's a certain way you behave in Cuba, and a certain way you behave in Denmark. Um, um, there are certain styles of dinner culture in certain countries that differ from others. Marcus Gabriel was writing about this, Gabriel was writing about this, that um, um, you know, when you go out to dinner in the United States, it's expected that dinner is going to last about 90 minutes, you're not going to drink too much alcohol, and then you're going to wave goodbye and say goodnight. 
Whereas in Germany, you're going to sit in the restaurant for hours, you're going to drink as much as you want, and you may go to somebody's, somebody's house for drinks afterwards. Um, if you're in Spain, you're going to go out to dinner very late, and so forth. And none of these things are ever explicitly stated. Right? You just have to go along with the style of the situation. In terms of the, the periods of art having certain styles, this, made me, this reminded me of Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science, which is consisting of paradigm shifts. And Kuhn has come under a lot of fire recently because I think he's been misread as saying, for completely arbitrary sociological reasons, science decided to shift from Newton to Einstein rather than because of rational arguments. I don't think that's what he means. I think what he means is that um, the entire style of the science changes. Once you, once you decide that Einstein is right, there's, you know, gravity is the curvature of space-time. It's not something that happens at infinite speed between any two points in space. It happens only at the speed of light, never faster, and so forth. Uh, then the way people approach gravity changes, and that is something different from the kind of science that Kuhn calls puzzle solving, where you're accepting a science and working within it, or when people are just doing hack work within an already established genre using cliches. Like if somebody writes a detective novel and has all the detective cliches or science fiction story and, and uses all the science fiction stock cliches, then there are certain works that add something to a style. Um, and I also think that a, every person has a style and ultimately every object has a style. Because what a style is, is it's something that's never fully exemplified in any specific case. Um, you can never find, you might, you might say that one particular tragedy of Shakespeare is the greatest and the most emblematic Shakespearean tragedy, but in a sense, Shakespeare's style goes deeper than any individual play. There's never any one line of Shakespeare where you have all of Shakespeare in a nutshell. It's something that exemplifies itself in many different plays and many different lines. Um, and so that's the sense in which I, I think style is an important issue, that it's not, style is a reality deeper than any of the individual works that it generates. Oh, sure. Quick follow-up. How, yeah. how do we then, as, um, as designers, creatives, or architects, reconcile style with um, authorship? Well, um, here's the way I look at it. I think sometimes authorship is problematized because it's associated with the cult of the genius and the individual, and which thereby downplays both collaboration and the social political factors of the environment that gave rise to a thing. I think what's interesting, what's, what's more interesting than the difference between the individual and the collective, I think, is the history of the object itself, no matter how many agents went into making it up. So, for example, the internet. Yeah, you can go to research and figure out who invented the internet. Or you could say Tim Berners-Lee invented the web browsing software. But in a sense, it's irrelevant in a case like that. It's not as relevant in the case of the World Wide Web as it is in the case of, of um, um, an artwork. I was one time at a dinner party in Chicago, and I met a guy and had a conversation with him. He used to work for Ford or General Motors, one of those two companies. And it turns out he was the guy who came up with the idea of backward-facing child seats, which is now a staple of safety around the world. Everybody knows to do this, right? You don't put your child in a forward-facing seat. It's not safe. And no one has any idea who this guy is. Even I've forgotten his name. It was his idea. He was the one per He told me the story. And assuming he wasn't exaggerating, he had to fight the bureaucracy at this company and push it through. But it doesn't really matter. Who really cares who invented that? I mean, he deserves the credit and a reward if we, if we can find out who he was. But what's important is that a new object has been introduced into the world, and it changes the way people seat their children in cars, and it you know, lowers the traffic fatalities for children. And so it's a good thing. Just like the World Wide Web changes our behavior patterns. Um, Amazon, even if you didn't know who Jeff Bezos was, even if there wasn't just one Jeff Bezos, but it was a team of 20 people who invented the company, Amazon has changed a lot of things, right? It, it has disempowered card, card catalogs. Don't, I mean, card catalogs and books and print catalogs don't really exist, right? At least not for me. I go to Amazon. If I want to know when a book was published, I go to Amazon. I don't, I'm not going to go to a library and open up a card catalog, and I'm not going to go to the books and print catalog. Right? I'm gonna get, your, your book does not exist if it's not advertised on Amazon, and there are some books that aren't advertised on Amazon for one reason or another. So um, who goes to a travel agent anymore? I mean, maybe once in a while, if it's a very complicated situation, I book my own trips because I can save money. 
So my behavior patterns have changed. I used to read newspapers every day. Now it's not worth buying a newspaper, right? Because they're becoming so small. Um, I think, you know, I, I read everything I need on the web. Maybe that's a bad thing, but I do. So um, in a way, I think the importance of both the individual and the collective is diminishing in comparison with the importance of the object. So that's how I would approach that question. All right, everybody enjoy your lunch then. Thank you very much, Joram Hamann.